when it comes to understanding the processes that control all of the things we're going to be learning about with respect to severe weather, it really boils down to getting really, really good data about how certain weather variables like temperature, pressure, moisture, wind speed and direction, all those things, how they change as a function of height through the atmosphere. And one of the ways by which we get this information is by launching weather balloons. Now, what you're looking at here, this is an old picture. We're going back to the you know, early part of the 20th century where we're launching a weather balloon. This guy will, he'll let this balloon go. And then this guy over here will look through this instrument and watch how this balloon changes in its position as it ascends through the atmosphere. And the goal was to discover what the wind shear was. In other words, how fast the winds were aloft. Now, wind shear is defined as the change in wind speed and direction with height. We wanted to know what that looks like. So we launched the balloon. Now, as time went on, we started to attach these metal boxes to the bottom of a string that extended off the balloon. And the design there was, as the balloon ascended, we'd scan it with radar. We could see it much, much, much farther away from the location where it was launched, and we can see it through a much greater depth in the atmosphere. The radar could scan there. So therefore, we can actually use the little metal box as a reflective piece, scan it with radar, and get much better information about its trajectory. Now, times have changed, and instead of launching balloons and watching them or scanning them with radar, what we do now is we attach a weather instrument pack to it. And that looks something like this. This is a video complimentary of the National Weather Service out of Reno, Nevada, and this guy is launching a weather balloon. There it goes in some extremely windy conditions, a 60 mile an hour sustained wind. Now, when you saw that go up, do you see that little white box on the end? That white box is the instrument pack, and the balloon takes it up through the atmosphere. And as it goes up, it radios back information about those variables. And that's why we call it a ray wind sonde. It's also called a radio sonde. Generically, we'll just call it a weather balloon. Now, as the weather balloon ascends, it measures temperature, dew point temperature. Well, technically, it measures relative humidity, but we convert it to a dew point temperature. It measures pressure, wind speed, and direction, and all of that as a function of altitude, height, as it goes up through the atmosphere. Now, when these balloons as uh, ascend, they typically pop somewhere in the stratosphere, but on their way up, they acclimate at about 1,000 feet per minute. We launch these things twice a day at time 0z and 12z, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But the total cost of launching these across the United States each day is around $250 each. It's around $18 million a year. So it's not that big of a, of a chunk of the budget for the National Weather Service, but they are expensive. Now, the instrument pack is right here. And when the balloon pops in the stratosphere, by the way, the balloon becomes absolutely enormous when it gets up there, simply because the pressure around it is so low, it just expands. Sometimes we attach a... Um, a parachute to it so as the instrument pack now this is an old school one here from the 70s okay as the instrument pack falls back down it's uh it, it doesn't fall down at a pretty fast speed but because the newer instrument packs are so small and so light sometimes we don't even have to put uh, the parachutes on them the leftover tethers of the balloon are enough to slow it down so this is it. We launch these weather balloons twice a day all over the United States, all over the world, and collect a lot of interesting information about the vertical profile of the atmosphere. Now, what I want to talk about is that 0z and 12z business. When it comes to understanding how we collect meteorological data, it's all done using universal coordinated time. Now, the abbreviation for universal coordinated time is actually UTC, and that's because it was initially French, and they would say it universal time coordinated. But in uh, English, it would be we switch everything around, so it's universal coordinated time. Now, UTC time is also Zulu time and GMT time. They're all the same thing. The G in GMT stands for Greenwich, and it stands for Greenwich Mean Time. Now, what that means and why there's significance in that is because Greenwich, England is on the prime meridian, and our planet is covered with time zones, and that's because the Earth, as it spins, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, but because humans are able to travel great distances in a short amount of time, we had to break up Earth into a bunch of time zones to properly account for local time. Now, I'm making this recording right here in East Central Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And during the months of basically early March to early November, we are in what we call daylight saving time for the central time zone. Daylight saving time. And during that time, we are five hours behind UTC. So let's think of it like this. If it were noon, if it were noon, so that would be 12Z on uh, the prime meridian, that'd be 12Z Zulu, or 12 Zulu, that would be 12 UTC or 12 GMT it would be 7 a.m. local time because they're to the east and therefore the sun rose there earlier. 
Now, it is daylight saving time, not savings time, and it was initially conceived to basically conserve energy, but in reality, it doesn't. There's been a lot of studies to see if we shift our clocks around throughout the year that it would save energy, but it doesn't. Turns out it hurts retail, it even hurts some sporting industries, uh, but there's certainly no energy saving with it. One very positive thing that comes out of daylight saving time is there's a very statistically significant decrease in the number of automobile to pedestrian accidents because uh, of the way we shift around the time uh, basically so that people are driving to work and home from work uh, during daylight hours. Now when we're not in daylight saving time we are in standard time and so CST stands for Central Standard Time. Basically from November to March we're six hours behind UTC or Zulu or GMT time. Now I've always had an interesting question about this and uh, because in the fall we quote fall back, in other words we gain an hour of sleep, I've always wondered what happens when this situation occurs. Well here's what happens on the Sunday when we fall back, this is what happens, at 2 a.m. all clocks are reset back to 1 a.m. so you gain that extra hour of sleep. But what if there was a woman who was pregnant with twins and she delivered her first twin at 1.58 a.m. on that Sunday and then four minutes later the second twin arrives which would have been at 2.02 a.m. but because we fall back to go to Central Standard Time it's now 1.02 a.m. What I would really like to know is which kid is older on paper? So anyways there's a lot of interesting things to be thinking about with daylight saving time and that's just one of them. Okay each one of the white dots that you see on this map shows us where we launch weather balloons twice a day all over the world, or really all over North America here. And why I want you to see this is because honestly, the network, the density of the network where we launch them is not, well, it's not very great. I would love to see them quadruple or, you know, even 10x the number of locations we launch weather balloons. You know, every time there's a major hurricane that's approaching the United States, we often launch balloons way more frequently and a whole lot more of them simply to capture the flow of the atmosphere better so we can initialize our weather forecasting models better. But during normal operation, twice a day at each one of these dots. One of the bigger concerns we have is we don't launch any weather balloons over here. So the only way we can get data there about the vertical transect of the atmosphere is through satellite. And that's not nearly as good as launching a weather balloon. So this is uh, some of the limitations on our weather forecasting. Basically, we don't have ubiquitous cover of weather balloons all over the world. Some locations like the US, North America for the most part, uh, and, and, and Europe have very high density networks of launching weather balloons where other places do not. So with this all kind of in the back of our mind, let's talk about what the data look like. Now, the weather balloon, the Raywin sound, when it is launched, we plot the data on a sounding diagram. And that's what you're looking at down in the bottom left. Technically, it's called a Stuve diagram. If you continue on with atmospheric science classes, we'll use a little bit different diagram than this called a skew T log P. But for our class, let's just look at what the diagram shows. It has temperature in Celsius on the x-axis increasing to the right. On the y-axis, it has pressure decreasing with height and altitude increasing with height. So this is basically a temperature versus pressure or a temperature versus altitude. Now, when the weather balloon is launched, it pops in the stratosphere. So we only really get to measure what's going on in the lowest layer of the atmosphere and a little bit into the stratosphere, but nothing to the depth of the stratosphere, the mesosphere, or the thermosphere. So we're just looking right down here. Now, if I were holding a weather balloon right now and we were collecting the data from it and I let it go, it would trace out over about an hour a profile that looked just like this. Ready? Watch the diagram in the bottom left. It takes about an hour to ascend that high, but it would trace out those lines on this diagram. Now, what are we looking at here? Well, the line on the right, the farthest line on the right, is the air temperature line. On the left, that's the dew point temperature line. Where they touch, the temperature equals the dew point and therefore we're in a cloud. Some other neat things. This inversion up here near the top, see where the temperature starts to warm again? We call that the tropopause. That is this point right here in the depth of the atmosphere. And we also have information about the winds as we ascend and these are wind barbs. Now you'll be learning throughout the rest of the semester that from this simple diagram, in an instant, you can get all of this different information about the atmosphere, what it can do. And uh, we'll We'll dig through all of that as we get through the semester, but I'm going to talk about winds first. I want you to think about the wind barb like a dart. You know, darts have pointy ends and they have the ends with the feathers or the guides. When you throw the dart, you throw the pointy end. All right, so here's your dart. 
you see the tick marks on the end, either the long, short, or the triangles, tell us something about the wind speed. If it's a half of a tick mark that's in off the edge, it's worth five knots. Here's one more 10. Put them together, you got 15. Two long ticks, one half tick, that's a 25 knot wind. So we can use these to tell us how fast the winds are. Now, when we get up to uh, 50, we don't, well, we don't keep just adding long tick after long tick. In fact, sometimes you'll have wind speeds that get up over 200 miles an hour in hurricanes or in the jet stream. That would be 20 long ticks. So every time we have five of them, we get rid of them and put a triangle. So a triangle is worth 50. So for example, this is a triangle plus a long tick plus a half tick. That's 65. Now direction. Look at this particular wind barb. We know because there's two long ticks and a half tick, it's a 25 knot wind. Now what is a knot? A knot is a nautical mile per hour. Basically 1.15 miles per hour is one nautical mile per hour. And for my class, I will be totally fine with you just assuming that a nautical mile per hour or a knot is roughly the same as a mile per hour, okay? So here we have a 25 knot wind, but what direction is it going? Well, here's how you figure that out. Put crosshairs on the pointy end, north, south, east, and west. Whatever quadrant it's sticking into, that is the direction the wind is coming from. And we always, always, always talk about wind where it's coming from, not where it's going to. Always from, not to. Okay, keep that in mind. So let me show you a real sounding. This asks you a couple of very basic questions. So this was out of Lincoln, Illinois back on February the 4th, 2016. It was 12Z. So if we subtract six hours from that because we're in uh, standard time, it would, have been, it would have been at 6 a.m. Now, temperature line is this one on the right. Dew point temperature line is over here on the left. Here's my question. Did this weather balloon pass through a cloud? Think about it. Well, the answer to this one is no. And how do we know that? Well, the two lines never touch one another. So there was no cloud that this weather balloon went through as it ascended back on February 4th, 2016. Let me ask you another question here about uh, wind speeds, okay? What is the wind speed and direction of the wind here at 300 millibars? So I just basically came over here uh, to 300 millibars and I went across the sounding and we're looking at this wind bar right there. What is the wind speed and direction? Well, when I look at this, I see one triangle, three long ticks, and a half ticks. That's 50, 60, 70, 80, and a half makes 85. So it can either be B, or it can be D, or E. Now, my next thing to do here, let me clear this off, would be to draw my crosshairs on this. So I can just do it like this. And what I see here is that my wind barb sticks here into the southwest quadrant. And that means E is my correct answer. This is an 85 knot wind from the southwest. So that was just a little bit of practice with these things. Okay, let me show you a real thunderstorm and let's look at what the temperature profile and the dew point temperature profile look like. In other words, if I launched a weather balloon into this thunderstorm, this is what I would have gotten. So here's my diagram. I got temperature versus height. The temperature profile would have done something like that. The dew point temperature profile would have done something like that. You can see right here is the base of the cloud. And below it, the temperature line and the dew point temperature line don't touch. And that's because below here, we're not in cloud. Now above it, you know, we can clearly see that we are in cloud. And that's why the temperature and dew point temperature line touch one another. But at the top up here where they split again on top of the thunderstorm, we found the tropopause. That's just where there's an inversion, where the temperature warms with height up here on top of the thunderstorm. Now some other neat things to know. From the bottom of the diagram up to that point where the tropopause sits, we are in the troposphere. From there above, you're in the stratosphere. So it's kind of neat. Whenever you see a massive thunderstorm like this, look above it. Wherever you see up here above it, you're looking up in the stratosphere. So it's just kind of a neat thing to think about here. All right, let's get some real practice with this. I'm going to launch a weather balloon. Here it goes. Real fast, all right? You got your temperature line and dew point temperature line, but do you remember which is which? I'm going to label them for you. The temperature line is on the right, and the dew point temperature line is on the left. Now here's a question. What is the air temperature at 700 millibars? Well, 700 millibars is right here. And this line that I'm kind of tracing out represents the 700 millibar line, which means we're ultimately wanting to know what is the air temperature right there? Well, on this diagram, look where you have the temperature line crossing the 700 millibar line, go straight down to the bottom of the diagram, and it is zero degrees Celsius, which means it's freezing right there, okay? Another question, what's the dew point temperature at 650? 
Now, if 600 is here and 700 is there, 650 is this line right here. So if we go across, what we're going to be looking for is what the dew point temperature is. Interestingly enough, the temperature and dew point temperature are the exact same, which means if I draw a line down there, what we will see is the dew point temperature was around minus 5. So minus 5 is the dew point temperature of this location. Also, what's the surface pressure? Well, let's look for the very bottom of the sounding, where the two lines start at the bottom. Read across, and I've already got a circle for you here. It's 1,000 millibars here at the uh, surface air pressure. Next question, let's go back to that region right in there at 650 millibars. What was the dew point depression? Now, what is that? The dew point depression is a subtraction. You take the temperature minus the dew point, whatever number you get, well, that's the dew point depression. You might be figuring this out to know that right now the dew point depression here is zero because the temperature and dew point are the same. Do another quick example. Let's go right down here to 800 millibars. What's the dew point depression? Well, there's 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and I went about halfway. So let's call that a 25 degree dew point depression. That's very dry air. Um, another question. Where is the tropopause? Well, when you're looking for the tropopause, let me give you a clue. Look at the top part of the sounding first, so way up here and look for your first temperature, not dew point temperature, your first temperature inversion near the top of the sounding. I see it right there. See how the temperatures are warming with height rather than cooling? Well, at that location, we have our tropopause. I just measured it off. Here's 250 millibars. We're just a little bit below that. Let's call it 255 millibars. That is the pressure at the tropopause. My next question for you, what is the fastest wind observed on this sounding? When you look up the side here, we automatically, let's search for triangles first. So I got these up here with triangles. This one is 60. This one's 100. Looks like this one is uh, 70. So therefore, my fastest wind is right there at 100 knots. That's two triangles. My final question for you as we do a quick review here is, what is the wind speed and direction at 500 millibars? Well, 500 millibars is here. Go across the diagram, and what we're looking for is that wind barb. When I look at this right here, I see that there are four long ticks, which means it's a 40 knot wind. And if we do our thing again, where we kind of draw the crosshairs on the pointy end, what I see is this is sticking again into kind of the southwest corridor. Now in atmospheric sciences 120, I'm not going to be too particular about you getting all the cardinal directions perfectly right. In other words, what I mean by that is we'll just use a four quadrant system. We have the northeast, the southeast, the southwest, and the northwest. Then we have north south, west, and east. Okay, since this is into the southwest quadrant, we'll call this a 40 knot wind out of the southwest. Okay, so 40 knots out of the southwest. That's how we'll look at this. Okay, not too bad. Did a pretty good job with this one. Now, as we get ready to finish up this video, I wanna show you one other thing here, okay? What you've got here, you've got two soundings. And if you've kinda of gotten bored by looking at the, all the squiggly lines in the sounding, watch that video in the bottom left with me. That's my good friend, Bruce Lee. And he is watching this uh, massive tornado here. And that tornado, well, Bruce knew where to chase it because he was looking at soundings just like this at a South Dakota. And that sounding, in an instant, he could look at it and go, wow, tornadoes. We're going to have tornadoes today. Um, as another example, let's kind of pause him. As another example, this is a sounding from uh, Lincoln, Illinois, back on December 9th, 2007. And Instantly, instantly, a meteorologist could look at a sounding like this and go, wow, there's a major, major threat for ice. And on that day, across a campus here at the University of Illinois, we had an inch of ice accumulation, and it was nasty, nasty weather. You see, we can use the data collected from the Ray Winson to do so much. And that's what I wanted to teach you about today, the very basics and how to read the data collected by these weather balloons.